Today, we have our friend Kia Neal here with us because she has an incredible story for us. Kia is a, just an incredible, incredible ambassador to the entire industry. And she has really worked hard to combine the concept that texture and race does not have to be one in the same. Her texture versus race education series is uh, debuted at the summit with the American Board of Certified Hair Colorists, where Kia was the first black woman to be a keynote speaker at their 2019 event. She's rewriting the book on textured hair. She is rewriting our perspectives on how we look at texture within our industry. But, you know, honestly, guys, this woman is just incredibly powerful, incredibly inspiring. So in the chat, please welcome our friend, Kia Neal. What's up, Kia? Andrew, how are you? I'm doing awesome because I know I'm about to have the time of my life yes, talking to are. my friend Kia. You know what? It's been about three months since I've really been on live and doing anything. And this is just really exciting for me. So I, I'm glad I get to do it with you. Yeah. You know, you're my boy. You know, we, you know, we do, that. We do this. Yeah. We, we've got lots of experience in StreamYard, right? <laughs> Yes, we love StreamYard and we do StreamYard together. Well, hey guys, I've been watching your 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 comments and hey guys, if you're watching, just I guess I should say it, if you're watching on Instagram, come over to Facebook because I want to be able to interact and look at your comments. But hey, you guys, hey Sam, thank you for having me. Just wanted to say that. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, so guys, as we're talking, as always, make sure you're showing the love in the comments. If you have questions for Kia, just pop them into the comments section. We'll do our best to get to them. But today, Kia, I know that the big thing we want to kind of tap into is you had a pretty gnarly experience with COVID. But in our conversation leading up to what we we're going to discuss today, it was pretty incredible how you were able to take this crazy experience and turn it into something that you feel like had lesson and some benefit to it. So um, um, maybe we just kind of start off with, you know, kind of share what happened with you. So I really want to just uh, one, just let you guys know that I'm here strictly because I'm sharing my experience so that we can grow together so that we could learn and just understand exactly what and how COVID is and how it affects us um, individually, how it, how it affects our family, our bodies, our health, our businesses. And I think that's truly important for us to share this message. So it's really great that you guys even want to talk about this because I know it's kind of like a, you know, one of those subjects where everybody's like, ah. Right. So back in December, I contracted, the beginning of December, I contracted COVID. And I didn't know that I had it for about a week. And I actually worked for a week. And, I, and I'm very part of the part of the time anymore, Andrew. So what I thought was really great about working that week is I had been in contact with more people than I probably had been in. Like, I, I don't think I had been to work in three weeks up until that point. Oh. But with me having COVID, once I did find out what I realized is not one person in my salon, not one client that I had direct interaction with not one co-worker or their clients contracted it and that made me really happy and i just want to start off saying that shout out to you guys yeah. for the work that we are doing in the salons to stay safe your efforts work yeah the sanitizing the social distancing the limiting capacity the cleaning the you know the mask all of that works. And I just want to start off congratulating not only the industry itself, but specifically my salon and my coworkers for the efforts that we did, because we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so the following week, I think when week two is when it really doubled down on me. Now, I just want to put that in perspective. Most people experience COVID in like maybe a couple of days of symptoms or a couple of weeks at best. And that's the majority. That's the 85% of people that contract COVID-19. But then there's those 15% that I got dropped into that really go the extra mile and it really takes a toll on your body. And so for me, it, it came to not just having all of the symptoms, but I also had to be hospitalized for six days for it. And it was really life changing because I didn't understand what it meant, not only in that moment, but even after the fact. 
And while I was in the hospital, what I thought was so awesome, and I just, again, I have to speak on the good parts and the bad, I really was emotional because I couldn't understand how did I fall into that? Mm -hmm. How did I get to be the fifth? Why didn't I just get the flu-like for a couple of days and kind of call it a day? And I was praying with a couple of friends, and one of my good friends, she just put out there that, you know, we need to pray for our industry sister, and she was asking for prayer. And of course, most people don't know, but I probably would have never done that on my own. I would have never really posted like, hey, you guys pray for me or, you know, I need this or that. She did that and it just it incited a lot of concern for my industry people. So look, shout out to everybody that called, texted, DM and listen, they went crazy in my phone. And I was like, OK, so what's going on? And when I realized that happened, I posted but I posted from the perspective of someone who now had COVID for like a week. I mean, like really had it like really into my symptoms for over a week. And I was just sharing my perspective from the bed, like from that perspective of, listen, you know, I'm not, I'm not good right this second. You got to give me a minute. I can't, you know, I can't talk. I can't, you know, FaceTime everybody. I can't, you know, and I just, want, I just wanted to dispel. That was my first post about it. it was like, yes, you guys, I wore a mask. Yes, I washed my hands. Yes, I sanitized. Yes, I social distanced. I did all those things you did. And yes, I still got it. Period. Stop. My mother hates when I say this, but I said, stop making me feel like, you know, or anybody else that you come in contact with, like we have contracted it as STD. And I said, I need us to stop, you know, making us feel bad or guilty or ashamed. And I said, it, I'm going through this, but this is what it is. And people were in my back office, like, thank you for your transparency. I really needed to hear that. You know, I've been going through this for a while. And that journey itself, Andrew, just seeing how many people were the 15% in our industry or not. Some of them weren't in the industry, but yeah. a lot of people in the industry were struggling and they were suffering in silence. And I realized that everyone had not had enough information on the 15%. Mm -hmm. We didn't know enough about what it really entailed and how to manage it, how to work through it how to to be supportive to someone that may be going through it and to understand even just the residual effects so it was just a long journey and i know that was a lot but that was kind of you know beginning yeah. and, end, and then i want to kind of you know us kind of bob and weave into into that and yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean i kind of want to like go back to where you started which is that when you did kind of figure out oh crap i have this how did you first connect with your salon and what was kind of going through your head as you came into the salon, like, or contacted your salon and said, okay, here's what's going on, guys. Well, I was a little, a little nervous because one, I had to not only contact my salon, but I had to have my family tested. Mm -hmm. so now my mother-in-law, my husband and three boys now all had to be tested. And it came back that three of them were not, two of the older boys were negative and my husband was negative, but my mother-in-law and my 10 year old were positive. Hmm. So that in itself threw me in a tailspin. Now sure. I will say my salon was very understanding. They didn't you know, go crazy. They were just like, oh my God, are you okay? And at the time when I first said so, I was, I was just, getting my results and I was into my symptoms, but I was not hospitalized at that moment. I should have been, but I didn't know enough about it to know that I needed to go to the hospital. I, let me gotcha. just start there. But right. when I told them about it, I was still at home. So I think their concern was just, as long as you're okay, we're all going to go get tested today. And if anything comes up, you know, I think they just went through the protocol. And they contacted whoever needed to be contacted and whoever needed to know at that time, whoever was there, you know, with me. It was and it, it was it was good to know that I had their support and they weren't kind of pointing fingers at me. Yeah. You know, they didn't say, oh, my God, well, where did you get it? And why did you know they didn't say that? It just was like, feel better. We'll see you later. But don't come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't come back here. <laughs> you don't belong here for a while. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll finish cleaning your station and quarantine your stuff. You're good for a while, sis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's interesting that you said that, too, because I think that that is kind of almost like that natural first response. Like, mm -hmm. well, where'd you get it from? 
and one of the things that you kind of said and that I do definitely want to touch on is that we tend to treat this thing like, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Are you out being promiscuous or some something? And it's like, no, like I've been doing all this, the right stuff. Like I'm following the CDC guidelines. I'm doing all my work and all that stuff. So yeah, there's kind of that first sense of, well, where'd you get it? What, what, what were you doing? Why weren't you being that, careful? That kind of thing. attitude. That's exact. I had a lot of people say, well, I mean, I mean, I, I don't mean to ask. And I'm like, yeah, okay, but you're going to. <laughs> but here we are. And they're like, I just got to know, like, do you know where you got? It? And I'm like, do you guys think I literally walked up to COVID and just was like, you look great. Like, mm, let me get some of that. You know, like, did I just go, hey, come with me today and affect my whole family? Like, I didn't. And I think what we need to realize is that we're always, always exposed. We're always exposed. And it doesn't take much. It does not take much. It takes the right moment, the right the right environment for your body to be in a specific state as well. Like, I feel like when I got through it, what really helped me get through it, I think were some of the, some of the things that I didn't have going for me at first, which was my immune system. I truly believe that my immune system was not strong enough. And I think I was vitamin D deficient. I think that helped play a part. So I think, you know, there's no algorithm really for who gets it and how you get it. That's the part I really want to hone in on. But I just want people to understand that you're always kind of exposed to things. It just, it's just kind of like a luck of the draw, really, because even if you're doing all the right things, you can still get it. And it and it doesn't mean that I was out at a party and my family had a reunion or I had a Christmas party or I had a Thanksgiving gathering. No one came over for Thanksgiving, you know? So yeah. Y'all must really be talking about me. My nose is itching. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> itching. You know, my mother used to say somebody's talking about you if your nose is itching and your ears are ringing. Yeah, I heard about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> You're funny. I love it. Yeah. So to that point, um, and, and actually, I, I like, you know, Rosie put in this comment that, like, I do think it's important maybe for people to understand where we got it from if it's like within the context of, OK, we work together. So how would you think that it would be appropriate to kind of have that conversation from that context? Cause I could kind of see like, okay, if I'm working in a salon with 20 yeah. other people, someone comes up with it, I might kind of feel like I, I'd, I'd kind of like to know where this came well, from. I think, you know? I think that's fair for those people, people that doesn't have any contact, just thinking that I've just been, you know, uh, inconsiderate or uh, just out there haphazardly living, I think. But my salon had every right to ask me, do you think, you know, when did when did you start experiencing symptoms? What was that? Mm -hmm. I think it's important for the people around you. I think that's a fair question. I think especially like when the young lady says, I think, and I don't have my glasses, but if, if I'm reading, reading a little bit, like it's a little blurry for me, like people in the salon, they had a right to know, like, do I think I got it from someone there? Like, you right. know, do I think I was somewhere else? And I can kind of narrow down where I was or what I was doing um, in the space I was because I don't hardly go anywhere. Right. So I can, I actually can narrow down <laughs> the vicinity and the timeline of where I got it just because I know my schedule is so limited and right. I'm usually always at home. So yeah, I do think it's good. But when people ask kind of like, well, how did you get it? Like, it's just such a, you know, like, mm, oh my God, like, how did you get that? But like, give me That's this juicy kinda, tidbit of gossip yeah, or something. Kind of, you know, cause I'm like, yeah. I mean, I don't really know. I can't really tell you, but I do share with people that are close to me, especially if they're involved in any way. Yeah. So yeah, of course. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think for a lot of them, too, it's that that curiosity kind of comes from a self-protection standpoint, too. Like if they know, oh, well, I got it because I went out to dinner at this restaurant or something like I know for sure, which would probably be impossible to know for sure. But mm -hmm. like if you could tell them, well, this is how I got it and that's how I got it. I think it's just our natural tendency to kind of want to figure out, well, how do I protect myself? Right. I can see and, that. Yeah, but I do think there's also people out there that just, no, some, people just being, <laughs> some people just being nosy. Like the people that ask me that really just, you know, for all intents and purposes, want to know, like, for like, well, you know, do you know? I can tell them, like, I really think I was just, I went to lunch one day and I don't hardly go. So I think it was just that day. Either it was, yeah. you know, something at the restaurant or, but I can't say for sure, but I can 
almost guarantee it was between that and because just timing wise. But mm -hmm. I don't want to say you shouldn't ask. I'm just saying be mindful when you ask how that person may feel. Right. You know, and it's right there with people. And I know people are going to probably argue this point. But when people keep saying, you know, you feeling better yet or how are you feeling? It sort of puts a little bit of pressure, even though you're asking like, you know, hey, I'm just checking on you today. How are things right. going? Some Sometimes we can hear it because of the way we we function, because the virus itself becomes like a managed thing. The symptoms and the and the effects of it is ongoing. And sometimes for us that are recovering or in an active recovery stage, it could take some time and we don't want to become impatient. And we so we want to keep saying, I feel great today. And then we feel bad the next day when we're not good. Sure. Because it's like a, a rotation of symptoms. Like one day you might be tired or the next day you got a headache or the next day you've got, you know, the coughing or, you know, one day you've got weakness or whatever it is. And it's like, we don't really know exactly how we're going to feel day to day. So it's, it, it just sort of gets, and I'm saying this for me, let me say, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but I will say for me, sometimes to answer the calls, like how you feeling today made me sort of feel like I just had to keep saying the same thing. Every day is different. Every moment is different. And, you know, today I'm having a good day. Tomorrow I might, you know, today I might be having a party. Tomorrow I might be in the bed. <laughs> so you just don't, you just don't know. So just being patient with that and knowing that people that are going through that, even if they go back to work, they may still be suffering those residual effects. And that's hard. That's hard mentally because it's a mental gymnastics, mental and physical gymnastics. I'm um, mm -hmm. doing that, you know, dealing with those symptoms. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I could see that just from even the perspective of having any other kind of illness or like disease or anything like that. Like you kind of don't want people every day. Are you better? Are you better? Are you better? Are you better? It's, it's, better? Hyper, it's like a hyper hyper healing you know, it's kind of like they're like, well, you should be feeling better by now. And I'm and I know nobody has called me to say it like that. And that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is sometimes I feel better and I go, I feel great, Andrew. And then the next day or so I gotta go, well, what happened? Now I feel like I'm beating myself up because I'm not healing pro properly or quickly, or I'm not feel like I'm going, you know, three steps forward, two steps back, five steps forward. You know what I'm saying? And, and it does feel it, it it does wear and tear on you. Some. So they they kind of suggest, or I would suggest to not be on the phone as much or to not have contact every day with people to just kind of give yourself some space to work through that journey and work through that recovery process. Cause it is difficult. It's difficult for the people around you. It's difficult for the people that do want to see you better because mm -hmm. they go up and down. It's like, you feeling good? Oh, you're not, you're having a bad day. Oh, you're feeling good? Oh, you're having a bad day. So all, all of you are, <laughs> are like, and for me, it's been like eight weeks. That's a long time. Yeah. You know, that's a long time. I've, I've had to take those naps the past two days. I took a nap today, like just overwhelmingly tired for no apparent reason. It's just yeah. a residual. I'm just going to have to deal with that for a minute, but. Right. You know, so how, I mean, how did you work that with your connections? Did you finally kind of tell people like, hey guys, I, I need some like peace and quiet here. I'm going to sort of like give myself some time to just chill out. Like how, how did you, um, I guess, create that space for yourself that you had that ability to um, just focus on your health, focus on yourself? One button, a do not disturb button on my phone. Great. Just don't answer. Just don't answer. Because here's the thing about my community. I love them and they love me and nobody. And I mean, not one single person meant any harm by, no. but most of them kind of understood just from me posting it from the beginning that I needed that space. They respected that. A lot of them would just, you know, they would start off, do not respond. <laughs> and then they would send me something, whether it was a scripture or just saying, sending you some love today, or, you know, just let me know if there's anything I can do or that, you know, people, my community, 
our community, we are some very loving people. And I think when I speak, I'm speaking globally, but I'm speaking to our community. But globally, you know, our community, our industry, we have some, you know, we're all about the heart anyway. So most of the people that were in contact with me, family and friends included, they really did kind of sit back and say, let me know. Everything was kind of like, you know, don't respond. I'm not looking for a response. And I think that was that was great. Nobody pushed up on me, but I'm just speaking from a general sense that it it can because I had a lot of people doing it. So I just kind of put the do not disturb sign on, especially at night or just when I needed that rest. And I just kind of put the phone away. And when I had the energy to respond, then I responded to as many people as I could. Yeah. And kind of called and they were fine with that. Nobody was offended or anything like that. But it, 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 it can get overwhelming, especially in the beginning, because it was so dire for me. Because right. my condition was so uh, was was so dire because I was experiencing so many, you know, uh, symptoms. My husband was overwhelmed because now he has to be responsible for updating and keeping people updated, and you know, talking to this one. And then you've got my mother's long distance. You've got my mother-in-law here; she's not well, and we're we're trying to keep an eye on her and then the, the child. And it was a lot for him, so he had to learn to do the same thing to just kind of put something blanket out and say, "This is where we are." Leave, leave it right there. Yeah. Keith's a good dude. I know he's a good care of you. He's a good dude. Yeah. Do not disturb. Yeah. You can't be afraid to use that one button. You got to. And I didn't know. Do not disturb and block. Those those have been the, my best friends last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so you kind of started to touch on something that I wanted to kind of ask you about because I know that you are such a deeply giving person and typically that's the role that you play in your relationships is you are always doing great things for, for everyone else. How was it to have to uh, kind of turn that around and receive the gift? That was tough. Now I'm going to tell you, I had to kind of go to God on that because that was a whole big thing for me to receive that much attention. I really don't like that. I don't like that much attention. I know people don't think so because they see me live and I'm talking, but usually I'm working on my purpose of being a giver. I'm a, I, I, I consider myself an industry changer and a change maker. And I believe in supporting and serving from, you know, from that part, from that part right. of me, like my whole platform is about serving people period, all people. It's not about getting, like I get because I do work. I am a for-profit entity. Now let's just keep that clear now. <laughs> I earn my money, okay? I mean, I'm, I make my own money, but I'm a servant in all things. You will find that to be a part of my story everywhere. So when the tables were turning, people were so gracious. Like, I mean, companies were doing things for me. They were starting like meal trains, Alpha Parts started stuff. Like they were sending me flowers. Like, people were sending me cash apps and flowers. And I had someone buy me pajamas and send it. People were sending me <laughs> supplements. I'm serious, supplements. People were sending me things to help me heal quicker. Um, holistic remedies, people were sending. I mean, we got food dropped off. And I've got food outside my door right now. Now I did order. I was going to say, didn't what? you just get some food today? I, I got to go get it. But <laughs> <laughs> we had people that were just dropping food off, like just to feed my family during that time. And, and I was not prepared for that. Like I was crying a lot just because I had never been in that space of having to receive that much love like a love bomb all at one time. And it was, it was very overwhelming. And to the point that honestly, I had, I got, I, I see a counselor. I'd started seeing a therapist um, mm -hmm. not long, just, just to get control of my life. She asked me, she said, you know, you seem to know a lot about yourself. Why you got me? I was like, I don't know. We're going to figure it out. <laughs> I was like, I don't know why I need therapy, but we'll figure it out along the way. And then when I, <laughs> It's Keith, Keith, like, type okay. in the comments why she, no, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling her about it and she says, well, why, why was that so hard? And she tried to help me understand why being in that position was, was a difficult position to play. And why did I feel that I had to earn every single piece of love or money? Like, why couldn't I just be, uh, why couldn't that just be something that I received openly as much as I gave it. So it was something for me to look into. Yeah. 
And um, but I did, and I, I appreciated it, and it was just oh my god, people were just so good and so gracious. But at the same time, there was that other side because there were so many people in my inbox that didn't have that same level of support. Hmm. They had been out for weeks and weeks and weeks and was troubles, you know, you know, were still dealing with residual effects and and you know their symptoms and you know they had families and um I just had to ask God, like, why am I here during one of my times? Like, why am I in the hospital? Why am I going through this? Why is all of this happening to me? And he just said, you know, uh, perspective is based off proximity. And Hmm. I realized that again, please. Perspective is based off proximity. You guys can type that up because I think that's something really important for us to 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 remember and to to almost to, to ingrain in our minds that perspective is based off proximity. And I had to be in that space so I could understand the inner workings of it from the inside so I could tell you. And so I could create a space and an environment where we could talk about it freely, where we could uh, put our, the, ourselves out there and have a safe space to discuss it. Just like we did the same for texture versus race. We, right. we gave people a platform to be able to talk about what they understood or didn't understand about different cultures, different races. Why were we so separated? And this was no different. It was like, how do I put together the, the the people that need help and the people that have the means to supply that help? So we came up with colors of COVID literally in the hospital. I can't breathe. And I'm on the phone calling people, you know, my, you know, my team, like, listen, this is what we got to do. So write this down and keep this like, what? what, why are you doing this? And I'm like, this is what God said. Get off my phone. And <laughs> Yeah, he's like, hang the phone. And I'm like, no, I got to get it out because this has to happen with or without me. And it had to happen. So we got that together. While I was in the hospital, we were developing a, a, a platform, a community for people to join so that people could discuss and say, one, they could get help if they needed it. Mm-hmm. Two, they could get the support and, and information if they needed it. And then three, they could offer insight to those that wanted to, that needed to know one, how to work through it. And for you, how to be a support system to people that might be going through it. So it's, it's, it's going to serve as a multi faceted platform for people, but more so a safe space for us to be, to talk about it, because I don't think that enough of us are talking about it. That's why we don't know enough about this side of it. And we take it so lightly. That's why we're still, you know, when we say, hey, wear your mask, I realize there are different points of view, but for humanity's sake, because we don't know who, we don't know what, and we don't know how they're going to experience it, it's just better to take the precaution and do the things that we can to to continue to strengthen ourselves and have preventative measures. Mm -hmm. So colors of COVID, you guys, I'll actually drop that link at some point. Um, I can add it in here real quick for us. So is it a web is a website or it is a community? And you know, actually it's on my Instagram. If they go into my link tree on Instagram, it says colors of COVID on Kia Artistically. So if you are not following me already, make sure you follow me on Instagram, but go into that link and and it's it's free. All you gotta do is go in and just be a part. If you see something from someone that moves you and you say, Hey, I can send them a DoorDash or I might send them a quick cash app or I might, you know, send a pizza to their house tonight. Like that stuff helps. You know, I had someone send me an oxygen reader (laughs) when I got home. Yeah. Like it was just a little thing to put on my finger, but I used it multiple times a day to understand where I was with my oxygen, my mother-in-law and my kid. Yeah. Necessary stuff. So, I mean, what, how how do I ask this? It's almost like, what happened or like how how did it come to you that okay even in this time of personal crisis like i have to be open to this lesson was it just that message like during your prayer that that kind of was like the the message yeah i was crying and i was like why me you know i saw some in the comments it is a real thing to kind of go why me but one thing that i've learned about my life and my relationship with my faith, my God, right? The way he speaks to me is during those times when I ask a direct question, if I'm silent long enough, I will hear the answer. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it'll just start coming to me just like that. Just like color culture. It just, it's a download. It's like, it's going to be this, it's going to do this. This is what it's going to serve. This is how you're going to do it. This is the products you're going to have. Like, it doesn't take me months and months and months and months to gather any type of, <laughs> you know that. When yeah, you, you came just to do me, stuff. <laughs> within six weeks, we had it done. Like, that was a whole event. Like, it was an idea and then it went, it was just, and it's just a thought and it comes to me in spurts like that. So when I was asking like, well, why am I here? What I've understood is that everything that I, that I go through when I think that it's just my, my space, where I think that I'm going through it for myself, I automatically switch into why well, I know I'm not going through this for me or by myself. So what is it that I now, um, what, what is it that I now need to do? Like, why am I here? How is this going to serve the community? How am I going to serve people? And I ask directly, what am I supposed to be doing with this? Why am I here? Mm. And I think I want to put a pin in it right here. And I just got to say this for everybody that's watching, that's going to watch. What we have to understand in our life is that everything that we experience is not for us alone. It's going to serve to help somebody on the other end regardless. Because for every negative, there's a positive effect somewhere along the line. We just have to be okay with that. And we have to accept that. And the sooner you accept that, the sooner you will be exposed or you'll actually have an understanding of why it was you were going through something. So for me, it was like, why am I here? Like, I mean, I've been healthy all year. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I haven't been going out. I've been in the house. I've stayed away from people. I blah, 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 blah. And God says, those people that's in your inbox, their name is not Kia Neal. They're not popular. But that doesn't mean that the support should be preserved for the popular. You got to create a space for them to get the same support. And that's exactly how it came to me. And I was like, what? I was like, true that, true that. You know, it's kind of like, how do you discredit that whole thought process? How do you even think that you didn't hear what you heard? I heard it exactly like that. Exactly like that. You're here because I need you to see it. But you're here to serve this community on the other side. You're here to create a space for people who need, because everybody isn't popular. Everybody's not going to be key. Everybody's not. And I'm not the most popular person in the world, but I am a very loved woman from the fact that everybody jumped in to, to, to love on me and share all of that love and support from people that I didn't even know. Like people were posting their, their clients were doing things for me. I was like, what Who is this person? They're like, yeah, I, I'm a friend. I'm a client of Ebony or I'm a client of Noel or, you know, somebody in California. And I was like, so clients, friend, because they they know this person loves me, they jumped in to help. And so I just feel like even though everybody's not popular, it doesn't mean that they have to be held off from having that same support. And that's what it was about. I saw a question up here that I really wanted to answer. Yeah, um, please. And I want to go back to it. It was a really good question. Y'all just give me one second. because I want Let me know which one and I'll, I'll pop it up on the screen. Okay. Um, shoot, I'm gonna try to find it. But if you have another question in the meantime, was it was it Tara's question about coming back to work and explaining um, what happened? Uh, I'm gonna keep looking for it real quick. Yeah, let me see what you tell them. Yes. Okay. Yes. It was Tara's question. God, it wasn't that far up. It was right there. Um, what do I tell them? I told my clients, I told my clients and I'm going to answer that one, um, um, where they were, whenever it is that, um, that I caught it, whoever I had contact with, I told them, I didn't have a problem with telling them on social media, because again, the stigma of it being something that meant that I was being reckless or, you know, inconsiderate in some way, um, I had to just push through that and understand that there was no shame in that. You know, honestly, a half a million people aren't dead because every last one of them were just incons- <laughs> inconsiderate, you know, or they were mm-hmm. just being reckless with their lives. Like, that's not how this works, you know, all of, because I know some people who are reckless that are still walking around like it's all right. You know, they're still arguing the fact of whether they're going to, you know, do certain things and have certain protocols in place. But I told them and and most of them, you know, they they were not most of them, all of them were very supportive. They all, and here's the, here's the caveat to it. None of them have called me and asked me if when were I going back to the salon? Like, Hey girl, how you doing? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. when you come in, nobody asked I need me. my highlights done. <laughs> yeah. Nobody said that, you know, I had one or two that I knew had things already going that might've said something like, 
um, you know, you had sent me to someone before you had a, uh, a referral for me. Do you think she would be fine with, you know, or are you fine with me calling her? And I was like, absolutely. But nobody pressured me. My clients didn't pressure me. The salon didn't pressure me to come back. I went back on my own. I haven't really fully gone back. I've done like one or two last week. I may do one or two this week, this weekend, but I'm not really pushing anything. Just taking my time, giving my body a chance to really recalibrate and get back into this because I get tired really easy. That's what I notice. If I, when I go to the grocery store and I've only, look, I went to the grocery store for the first time this week too, since probably Black Friday. Wow. Yeah, that's real. <laughs> I hadn't been to a Marshalls and TJ Maxx since, Black, since before Black Friday till recently. And I was like, what? it was like a new thing. But of course I was gloves and, you know, I look like. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're about to do surgery. Yeah, they were like, what? I was like, can I get one of your gloves as well, please? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put three on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because now I'm just really, really shaky. And it's not because I think I was doing anything wrong. But, you know, once you experience that, it it does color it a little bit different. Sure. You, I can imagine. I'm sure. You know, it took me a minute to get out of the house. I was like afraid. Like, no, I'm not going anywhere. And my husband was like, no, that's not good. So now let's deal with that. But that's trauma. Yeah. And it's just about dealing with that, you know? So I've worked through that. So now I'm ready to, to get back out there and really be a part of society, you know, and, and doing my part still with social distancing, sanitizing, wearing my mask, you know, all of those great things. Yeah. Yeah. And for, you know, the people that haven't even had COVID, I think there's a lot of that kind of fear to get back out and to actually kind of participate in some some level of society, you know, that feels safe, I guess, safe enough. So um, how how do you kind of get that courage up or what? I, I don't know what what to call it, but how do you get to that place where you're like, OK, I'm, I'm going to take a step out the front door? Prayer. And you really have to just do it. I sat in the car for a while. I'm not going to lie. I sat in the car for a while um, and I just had to give myself and, and speak to myself the same way I speak to other people. You were not being reckless. You were not um, you were not doing anything wrong. This isn't your fault. You know, take the same measures. Do what you would have done before. Keep wearing your mask. Double up if you need to. But, you know. I had to give myself the talk too. My husband had to talk me off the ledge some, but I also bought a, you know, I also had a new addition to my family. Oh yeah. And she needed some stuff. So really she was kind of the first thing that took me into like the pet store and just trying to get some stuff for her. Um, that was the first, the first time. And Dana said, what? <laughs> no DJ Maxx Black Friday. <laughs> and that, she understands me. That's a hard the TJ thing. Maxx love is real. I'm telling you, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and Home Goods, like, mm. ugh, it was, it that was a while. That's I know. dangerous. It's, it's a listen, but I went and, you know, it was good. So getting that puppy was, was good too. It was almost kind of therapeutic for me to get the puppy too. Do we get to meet the puppy? Yes, y'all get to meet the puppy. Yes. I'm, I don't want to yell, but I'm going to tell them to bring the baby down so y'all can see. Hold on. Y'all stay right there. Let me tell them. <laughs> you guys have to see this puppy. It is ridiculous. It is adorable. Stay with us, everyone. Don't go anywhere. I promise this is going to be good. Don't leave. Stay here. Stay here. Nope. I'm here. I, I didn't go far. But my puppy served as... um. My puppy was therapeutic and she was therapeutic for me because I needed something now. I needed something else to focus and concentrate on. Oh, look at my puppy! Don't you lick me in my mouth now. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to get me. <laughs> oh, dogs love to aim right for the lips, right? Oh my God. Hi, pumpkin. <laughs> and people know I love I love puppies, but I don't love, you know. Lick me in my face, but you know, we we working on boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> that but dog looks like it's made it. of velvet. I know she is. She's so cute. Look at that. Say hi, guys. <laughs> Hello. This is Cooper. And Cooper is my son's best friend, 
dealing with COVID, dealing with his mom, seeing me like that mm -hmm. was hard for him. So he needed something else to focus his attention on as well and something else to love and to do. Oh, they oh my had gosh. Them. It is, that is like one of the most handsome Frenchies I think I've ever seen. I know. Yes, Katie, she's a French. She's so cute. Cooper with a K. Y'all know everything is a K. <laughs> Kia, Destin, Keith, Cooper. <laughs> everything is a K. She's so cute. And I love her, but she is, hey guys, can you? So I had a comment, I'm on Instagram as well. And they said, how can we help this cause? And I would say, join the community and be a part of the healing for anybody that shows up on there. Um, keep looking at the post and see, and I'm gonna encourage, cause I know people are scared about posting and I know I'm shifting, but I just saw that comment. No, okay. Or yep. I didn't skip it, but I want you all to join the community. And when people say like, you know, I need help or, um, you know, I'm, I'm home and I'm not working, do what you can. Hanging with Cooper. You totally. So hanging with Mr. Cooper. Yes, Mr. Hanging with Mr. Cooper. But if you guys see someone that's on there that says they need help, just help. Do something to help somebody, you know, whether it's just sending us a, a small donation, whether it's financially or doing some type of, of you know, service, but serving people. That's the biggest thing is serving and supporting each other because we're not getting a lot of help out here. Yeah. And I think people need to be more inclined to discuss and to share that they're having these problems or these issues and that they're home or that they're struggling, whatever that is, and us and us to just get in there and support. So that's that's how you can support it. Like if you want to send a donation, I'll send it to them directly. I'm working on actually making that um, a nonprofit because having Great. it as a nonprofit will allow me to accept donations directly so that when people um, have issues, we can meet their needs if it's on a, a bigger level than just, you know, a, a $20 cash app or a hundred dollars. Sure. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. we're working on that. So, but if you want to send it to me, it, you know, you can always cash out texture versus race. And listen, we, we, we send money out all the time to people. Right. Coop. Right. Coop. Yes, we do. Yeah. You're, you're such a, you're such a service oriented person. And that's just something that's super inspiring. And, but I love that message that it's like, I think sometimes we picture to help something, we have to make this like huge step or like we have to do something so dramatic but sometimes i i forget just the the one thing like even if it is like just 20 bucks in the cash app to your friend that's like having a rough day or having a rough time with something like that mm -hmm. that's putting good energy into the whole world it is and here's the thing you do one thing somebody else does another somebody else does another that person does something for somebody else you don't know how you trigger that effect it's like a domino and i yep. just i just always encourage people to do something when i see people going through stuff i don't say every time i do something for somebody you know and you and you just you just get in where you fit in like if i if i say oh i, I only have 10 bucks to share or five dollars to share trust me if enough people do it you know, uh, uh oh, I saw something good. But if you, you know, if enough people are doing small things, then it makes a bigger difference. You know, small steps make, you know, make big, big steps, make big room. Yeah. Like you're always going to get somewhere as long as you're moving. So I don't think people should be, you know, looking like, oh, I just can't, I can't give a hundred dollars or I can't give, you know, 200 or whatever. No, buying their kid a pizza so they don't have to worry about dinner is life changing. <laughs> I'm telling you, when we, when we, uh, you see daddy, you see daddy. Uh-oh, uh-oh, look at it, y'all. She ready to go now. <laughs> so when you see, you know, having someone just doing something, like, um, I don't know who it was that sent pizza to my house. They, they sent like two pieces of salad and some wings, and we were all just sitting there like, who sent this? Like, where did this come from? But, but I couldn't cook. I couldn't do anything. And it was just so amazing. One of my clients sent us food that lasted like three days. Like it doesn't have to be big. It's just any level of service blesses them and it blesses you. And we got to understand that you, you, you can only give, you can only get what you, what you give. 
I'm a, I'm a fan of that. You get what you give. So if you give good, you get good. Mm -hmm. Period. Yep. And that's the thing. It's like, it, it's so reciprocal. Like, I really believe that the, like our universe is so reciprocal. And it's yeah. like, the more that we kind of put out that's good and positive and supportive, we'll be taken care of, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to happen. And it's not out of expectation, of course, like, it's not like you're giving with that expectation that it's going to come back, but that's just, it's kind of like how, how things work. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like, it's, it's a whole, I know people talk about, you know, the energy and the synergy around that, but it's just, I really am a fan of, doing more and expecting less, but I always get more. Like every time I do something for somebody else, I promise y'all, I could show you. It's, it's like, it's almost freaky how it happens, but every time I send something out, it comes back. Every time I start a cycle of, and I'll just give a perfect example. Like I think it was uh, when COVID first hit, I was in the grocery store and I'm gonna be honest, I was not financially well during that time. And, um, you know, we all were struggling. We were, you know, just kind of fresh out and not working and, you know, things were just going on at that time. And, but I had enough money to swipe my card for the food I felt like I needed without having to look at my bank account. <laughs> Be like, wait a minute, did I move enough money over? Mm -hmm. And I was in the store, like stocking up, stocking up. And I think I bought like a thousand dollars worth of stuff. I ain't never bought a thousand dollars worth of no food nowhere in nobody's grocery store. Like I don't, I just don't. Um, a matter of fact, I hate spending money on toilet tissue and paper towels and stuff. Right. Anyway, I digress. And I was in the store and God said somebody doesn't have food because I was just thanking him and I was like, God, thank mm. you so much that I can do this without feeling, you know, stressed about not having money to, to, to stock up. Cause at this time we were, now we were fighting over, you know, getting toilet paper and whatever have you. And, um, God said, somebody doesn't have it. See who that is. Like just post something. I was like, post something like, why do you post, you know, cause I'm looking at it like, Oh, it's going to be a whole bunch of people trying to, you know, just get some money from me. And God says, Nope, post it. So I stopped in the middle of Costco and I said, if you don't have money to buy food right now, inbox me. Wow. And this girl, one of the girls inbox, she says, I don't even know you. I don't even know why you're on my timeline because I don't follow you. She said, and I was just asking God, how am I going to buy water for my family? And then this shows up. Wow. And I was like, no way. And then somebody else, they did the same thing. Like it was just, I need help. And then it started being, if anybody needs help, let me know. So then I started putting people together. And I'm like, well, just put your cash app in my inbox. Like it, there wasn't a lot of, a lot of uh, explanation necessary. So then I just, by the time I got in the car, Andrew, with my stuff, I was taking cash apps and cutting and pasting and putting it in different people's inbox from the people that wanted the help, from the people that needed the help. And at the end of the day, I ended up with the exact same amount of money <laughs> that I started with because I had put out so much money, but I was getting so much money back in. And it just was like, it was a wash. And it was like, now see, You've given out thousands of dollars today and you have lost not one dollar. <laughs> How does that happen? Like, I'm just I'm dead serious. Like I took pictures of it just so I could show my husband. He's a believer and he understands that that's a real thing. But I'm just saying, like, the more you give, you have to understand that God's going to take care of you on the other side. Mm -hmm. So I'm never hesitant about giving something to somebody or buying their coffee in the line or paying for somebody's grocery or, you know, giving somebody something on the street, you know, or giving extra tip to somebody like your, your, your service providers in restaurants or something, or even the people that deliver to you, because now you're not going to the restaurant, you know, they're not getting as much money. So why not tip them anyway? If you drove to go get it, if you picked it up, I still tip them like, like as if I ate there. Right. And I never, I never want for anything. Yep. And I, just, I, I can honestly say that with, when I think about my network of people that I connect with and like the people I know in this world, the, the ones that have a true heart of generosity and that are the most generous, the most just like freely giving are the actually the most truly wealthy. Like, and please understand, I'm saying truly wealthy. Because are there people that I know that are stingy as shit, <laughs> excuse me, yep, yep. stingy about their, and they do have big bank accounts. Yes, that exists. But 
I don't consider those people wealthy because wealth is much more than what's in your bank account, right? Yes. And but the the people that are so generous and so giving and just like so just the heart just comes out and it's like, yeah, I'm here for you. Those are the people that I really look at and I'm like, that's true wealth. Absolutely. Wealth is is in your health, first of all. Mm-hmm. Taking care of ourselves mentally, physically, spiritually, all of that is relevant. To me, that's wealth. Like when I learned how mm-hmm. to self-care, that was wealth. Learning how to not feel like what you give can't be stolen. That was a big one for me. I realized that no one can steal something if you're giving it. Even if I post mm-hmm. on social media randomly, like if you need something right now, I don't know who that person is, but somebody, it always shows up. It always shows up. And it just seems like God protects me because, you know, he protects fools and babies. So he doesn't really let anybody take advantage of me. But I kind of feel like if you take my money and knowing that you that you mean me no good or that you took it under false pretenses, he'll deal with you on that. I don't have to. I don't have to. As long as I do what I do with the great intentions and from the heart. Now, I'm no fool now. Let's just be clear. I'm no fool. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm, I'm very led by the spirit. And I'm very in tune to it. So I very seldom get taken advantage of. And if someone had to go that far to try to take advantage of me, I feel like, go, do you? It's okay. No. There was a question in, in this young lady, um, Lisa. She said, when it comes to your salon, do you ask your clients the questions uh, doctors ask before we enter? Yeah, yes. Uh, if you tell them they just go back, they got back from Florida, what do I tell them? So we have a form that... <laughs> tells that says, you know, have you traveled? Have you done, you know, especially out of the country? Have you been in contact with anybody? Have, do you have any symptoms? And we take temperature. I'm going to tell you the truth. We've had at least two or three instances. And I know at least two instances that I know of where people filled out that form with all no's and everything's great. And they still popped up positive and they called back and said they were positive. That's why I said we're always exposed because no matter what people answer, there's still always that possibility that they didn't know. Just like mm-hmm. I didn't know. For a week, I thought I had my yearly appointment with my sinuses and my um, my respiratory infection. I Every year, December, the first part of December, I go through that. So I just thought that's what it was because it was no different. I was treating things symptomatically. Same thing with other people. May or may not, or they may not have, they may be asymptomatic and they didn't know. And maybe for whatever odd reason, a symptom or two showed up after the fact. But I do, we do ask the question and try to vet people out as much as possible. But people kind of know you're going to ask the question. So we just try to encourage them. Like, if you know you're going to say yes to some stuff, stay on home, sis. Like, don't, don't come in just trying to get your wig fixed and because you, you know, just being selfish. But oh my gosh, I would like to think people didn't know. But, I don't know. You know, sister, sister so and so, you know, your client such and such, you know, she's trying to get her hair done. She may lie. That's why it's just so important for us to do what we're supposed to do and and have the correct protocols and procedures in place so that we're protected from people who may actually lie to you because they might Mm -hmm. or not. Right. And, you know, to your point, Kia, I think that that at this point in where we are in the world, that's kind of so important on so many levels is we we have to do our best and also accept the fact that everything we do, every time we walk out the door, there's a there's a chance of something. You know, my mom and I were having this conversation the other night. I'm like, mom, you know, every time you, you walk out the front door, mm-hmm. you, you could be hit by the crazy drunk driver that drives up onto your lawn and he's takes you out. Like there, there is risk in walking up there's risk in sitting in your living room, you know, so it, it's kind of like we, we have to, we have to take that calculated process of let's do our best. Let's make it right. And let's understand that we still have to have a life. We still have to live. We still have to, you know, have a living. And, and like you said, if you look at the facts about salon industry in particular, especially you can go to the CDC, you can look at the, the research. Salons are a pretty darn safe place to be. Listen, the salon was the safest place for me. I mean, they were safer than any place else I've been because we didn't have not one issue. So mm-hmm. I feel like, yeah, you're right. Like the salon have been doing a dang good job. 
um, of keeping down the numbers and stuff. That's why I'm so happy for California. I just want you to yeah. and know that there may still, hey, there's still going to be a small group of people that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, but I don't think they represent the masses. I don't think they re represent the majority. And I think, all uh, in honesty, that the salon is probably one of the safest places we can be. I really do. I think that we were already had strict sanitation and you know policies in place and i also think that we're we've kicked it up a nice you know couple of notches to to help us and i think that my salon first kudos to them we have done a great job because we didn't have that effect we didn't have a rippling effect we didn't infect the whole uh salon and everybody that was in there um carrie says she has some great policies in there and you're right we do tell them to uh, a lot of places that I go to will tell me wait in the salon but my salon is 4,000 square feet so our capacity compared to the people that work there don't require them to have to sit in the car but if the, but usually for me I do ask my clients to wait until I ask them to come in and then they come in they fill out a form they get their temperature taken and they're guided to um, this the sink that's in the front that was in the refreshment areas is a sink there and they mm -hmm. wash their hands there so everybody before oh, wow. they even enter the salon is it's like we we take everything from you. We ask you to limit the things that you bring into the salon, so you don't, you know, bring your, you know, try not to bring your purse. If you can bring your card and your phone and your mm -hmm. keys, you know, we try to encourage that. We try to encourage not bringing your coat. But it's Maryland now; it's winter, so we're back to, you know, <laughs> leaving it at the front. But before, we just asked them not to bring much. Don't eat. Don't drink. You know, all the standard stuff, and it works. It really does work. So, yeah. Very cool. So what do you hope? Because, of course, the whole subject here was the lessons of COVID. So I know this is a big question, but what do you hope is the big lesson for our industry from COVID? A couple of things. One, wear your mask, guys. Um, I want you to understand that it's not just about you. It's about being a good human at this point. Like regardless of how you feel or how you've experienced it or what you have heard about it through your proximity of people is, is really important for all of us to do our part to try to overcome this whole pandemic together. We can only do it if we're all on the same page. That's one thing. Two, do it because you understand now, even talking to me, that there are people out there suffering. This is a real deal that has long lasting effects that you may not know anything about. And I want us to be you know, just mindful of that, that those people may need your help. And if you can be a support, whether it's emotionally, financially or whatever, do that. Get a servant heart and start supporting people, especially your, your industry people. Let's get together in these communities and, and talk about it and, and share information of how to prevent ourselves from actually getting COVID or what to do if you do get mm -hmm. COVID. Because I think that we've learned a lot along the way. I have definitely learned a lot along the way and just how to manage the ideology of you contracting COVID and not making people feel bad and making them shun themselves and go hide in a corner somewhere, which yeah. is why you don't know. <laughs> about what it is. Just being kind to people, like even having more uh, kindness towards your clients. You know, if they get COVID, they're only, they're only contagious for a certain amount of time. They need to quarantine. Just understanding exactly what it means and not, I saw somebody make a comment, like making them feel bad about having COVID or feeling like, oh, I'm not going to do you. No, we just have to understand how to, how to work around it and how to manage it. And I, I think that's what I want everybody to walk away with is just having more of an informed heart so that we make the right decisions along the way. And just mostly how to be supportive to people who may uh, experience COVID differently from you. Not everybody is going to have to go to the hospital and, you know, not everybody is going to have to be on a ventilator. Thank God I was not on a ventilator, but I did have to have oxygen. I struggled with that for weeks and weeks, um, having that whole thing and still dealing with um, the symptoms understanding how to support somebody in that and how to make them feel better and what you can do to help them through that time because it's real. Yeah. So just having a safe space to land, a safe place. That's what Colors of COVID is doing, just giving you a safe place to land. It's for you that if you want to be a part of that community, whether you just have the means and just stay away from being the person that has the need. <laughs> We're trying to yeah. keep you from getting it and then just being a, a support to someone who may actually do. Um. This has been as awesome 
as perfect as we knew it would be Kia. Make sure you guys go follow Kia, Kia artistically on Instagram. Her connection is, you said that the colors of COVID thing is through the link tree on her Instagram. It's all Facebook too, right? A Kia. Yep. I, and it's on Facebook as well. I'll post it again, just so you guys can see the logo and see the link. I'll bring it back to the top, but absolutely go in there. It's colors of COVID K is spelled with a K, both of it and COVID. So you'll be able to see it right there on that link tree. I look forward to seeing you guys in there. I'll be doing some more correspondence this week and just kind of really sharing some more intimate details about that time and about my purpose in that time. Right. Because it's yeah. a lot to it. You know, we couldn't get to it all today, but I'm telling you, there's a lot. And I'm going to be sharing those things inside of that group. And it's, it, it's worth it's worth reading and listening. Yeah. Well. Thank you so very much, Kia, for taking this time with us. We know your time is super valuable and what a gift to give to this community and to you, the community. Thank you for spending time and being open to this information. We know it's a touchy subject, but we really felt like it was important to have Kia here to share her experience, to share her lessons from COVID. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you, Kia. You're just a total inspiration to us all. Thank you, Andrew. You know, you are my good, good friend. I love you so much. And I just appreciate you always leaning in and being there for me. And this was just an amazing platform to do this period for the industry. And I'm glad that, you know, my voice could be heard. Thank you, Sam, for even having and creating this and sharing uh, my story with your community. So thank you so much. You know, Sam is always doing that too. He's always leaning in to the, and being the backbone of our community. So I appreciate that. Beautiful. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. I'm reading your comments. I'm going to go back and read your comments and I think it's going to be saved on Facebook, right? So I could go in and kind of, so I'm going to go back in and try to answer some more questions. So thank you guys. Much love you all. We'll see you next week for more education. Yeah.